between my eyes Walked through the park, came out better on the other side See life's like a peach if you find the sand And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Atari, and many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, where entrepreneurs of six, seven, and eight-figure businesses come together live and in person every few months to solve their biggest business challenges and leave with lifelong friendships. Chad Rubin, who's also a friend of Steve, has come to one of them. Check out Rise25.com. It's run by myself and co-founder John Corcoran, and it's application only. Today, I'm excited. We have Steve Weiss. He's CEO and co-founder of Mute6. In just under three years, they've built a team of over 20 people, and their company uses online advertising like Facebook and Google Ads for e-commerce customer acquisition. They help build high-volume lead generation funnels. Basically, they help get businesses more customers. That's what everyone wants, right? Steve, they have worked with so. brand, right? They worked with brands and companies like MeUndies, USA Today, Headspace and many more. Steve, thanks for joining me. Hey, thanks for having me. I think Appreciate it's the first you. person I've had that we have the same last name, different spelling but same last name. Um, the same town in Poland, I think, right? right so exactly, exactly. <laughs> so I want to go into, I mean, you have so many successful case studies, and we're going to talk about that side, the e-commerce side of things, but you have an eclectic upbringing, so many fun facts about you, um, which I want to talk about, because that's sort of why you are who you are today. And one thing I was reading about, so you're a former stand-up comic? Yeah, so I performed stand-up comedy all over New York City for three years. Uh, after after college, uh, I didn't, you know, like most people, I was kind of lost. I didn't know what I wanted to do or how I wanted to do it. And, you know, comedy always brought me a lot of joy, being able to connect with people through humor. That's like one of my biggest passions in life, and it still is. And I think that's also helped me a lot in online marketing because online marketing is all about connecting with people. So what was the worst crowd that you've performed in front of? The hardest crowd. So I'll, ne- I'll never forget this. Uh, <laughs> beautiful uh, stress factory of New Brunswick, New Jersey. Um, you know, it's one thing when you go on stage and you hear the crickets. You hear, like, just people saying nothing. Well, I remember uh, I went on stage one time and um, this this girl, she was drinking a beer and she burped so loud right in the middle of my skin. It disrupted my brain from thinking. I was like, what, what, what just happened? And she laid out... <laughs> A, a burp that literally just everyone turned around and looked at this girl and that was kind of the worst experience i had because in comedy you want to you know you got to keep going no matter what no matter mm-hmm. if you suck you're good you're getting laughs you just got to keep going and this time like i had to stop my skit and just start laughing and just try and like keep it i'm like what just happened here like <laughs> it was very disruptive but um that's probably the, the the thing that just jumps right out of me is that long, elated woman who burped while drinking a beer during my comedy. You skit. stuck with it for a while. It's a tough road. I mean, I've talked to some some comedians. It's not an easy path. What made you finally change paths, change course? Um, that's a good question. I think I've been running online marketing companies since I was sixteen. I got into this the early internet marketing industry at a very young age, so I always felt. Like, this is where I should be going. This is where I need to be at. Um, yeah. Comedy was more of a way for me to get away from my current state of not knowing what I should be doing. It was kind of my way of relaxing and doing something I really enjoyed doing. And I think it came to a point where, you know, comedy wasn't getting me to the stage of success that I really wanted it to be. And it turned out that I need to leverage my skills at comedy and my skills at communication to really build a company and become a leader. And I think... That's when it resonated with me that I have to – everything needs to come together and I got to go to something where I could truly be successful and feel good about. Were you doing online stuff while, like during the, the days while you are doing the, the comedy stuff? Yeah. So actually it's interesting. Uh, the way I got into online marketing, I was a, I was a big troublemaker as a kid growing up. Uh, I would always yeah. get put in detention. And- Yo, Steve, <laughs> I, was, I read this. All the teachers in my childhood thought I would be in jail. Yeah, and they discredited me. You don't seem like someone I'd look at and be like, oh, this guy's going to be in jail. What was it? What were you doing as a, a kid that made them think you were going to jail? 
I had a, I had a massive like chip in my shoulder. You know, I always thought every as a kid, I always thought everyone was out to get me and talking shit about me. I, I, you know, I, I just didn't trust anyone. And it was interesting. The way I got into online marketing was I I always would get put in detention. I I had more detention than there was days of school. So they'd be like, just pile them up. And during detention, one time our detention hall got overrun with a flood or there was some type of flooding in New Jersey at the time and we had detention in the computer hall so when I was on the in the computer hall there was nothing to do except go on the computer and just surf the web and that's how I got introduced to online marketing was from these long days in detention surfing the web trying to figure out how to make money online when when did you make your first dollar uh-huh. um, when I was six, 16 years old, I was doing, I was an affiliate marketing of an adult dating website. An adult <laughs> dating website? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was when I first made my first dollar. I was like, oh my God, there's actually a business here in sending people to adult dating websites to sign up. Got it. What, why did you have a chip on your shoulder? Um, because, you know, I mean, I think it has a lot to do with just, you know, you grew up in a single mother household and you grow up in, you know, and you know that middle class, lower middle class neighborhood where, you know, you're always, people always look at you and say like, you know, you're not going to make it because, and mm-hmm. I feel like my whole childhood was people were always trying to, you know, tell me why I couldn't be something. Really? Whether it's, whether it's you know, I didn't, I didn't make the ninth grade basketball team. And I remember just the resonating fact of like, you know, I worked so hard at basketball, you know, I'm like. I didn't make the team. This is like crazy. And I, it's little stuff like that just keeps building and building and building to a point where you're like, you know what? You know, I know I want to make it so hard that like I'm going to keep working no matter what because I know what it feels like to not be successful. Yeah. Tell me what it was like growing up because I was also reading you have like a really in-depth blog. People should definitely check it out. Your personal yeah. blog. And you talk about how your mom worked three jobs and raised you and your sister. What yes. was it like? you know, growing up for you? So my mom, she grad, she went back to college. She went back to school to get her, her like master's degree. Yep. And then, you know, she, she'd go to college. She'd deliver bagels at night and then she'd work another bagels. job. Teacher. Yeah. She, she delivered bagels at, and I, I would never see my mom and my mom would, hmm. then I would have all these friends who my mom would drop me off to babysit me at my, uh, you know, I have a, two really close friends to this day that, you know, I'll never forget that I used to go to their house after school and they would always feed me. And, I'm so appreciative of them feeding me rice and beans every single day after school because my mom, you know, a lot of times my mom came home really late. She never cooked for us. Mm. Yeah. And like, I, I think that, that hard work, man, you, you know, you, you get older and you see like the hard work and the commit and the sacrifice that people, you know, that people have done for your life. And, you know, you, you really, it inspires you. It's just, it's this energy that just keeps pushing you that, you know, my mom never gave up. I know how difficult it was. Then, you know, I should never give up. Yeah, so you think you kind of by osmosis saw how hard your mom worked, and that's sort of the work ethic you have too? Exactly, man, because you never, you know, my mom was really hard on me. You know, she was always like, you know, there's this no pain, no gain mentality to life, you know, that like no matter how hard it gets, you know, you got to use that as fuel. However hard it gets, you got to use that as fuel to push forward. Everyone always likes to make excuses as to why they can't do something, and I always used to turn that around and say, all right, you know, that's fuel for the fire. That's, this is going to motivate me because I didn't make the basketball team, because I didn't get, because I never got A's, because my teachers never listened to me, because, well, that's fuel to be successful in the future. Because I'm going to, I'm going to put that as a chip on my shoulder and really push forward as hard as I can. Steve, you founded Mute 6 with Dan, Dan Rupper, yeah. right? So how did you meet Dan? So we were, we were, um, we were working out of a friend's office. So Dan... Dan had another company, which was, like, I guess, a, a much smaller consultancy shop that did like search engine optimization services. And I was working out of my friend John's office. He, he allowed me to do my little business that I was doing at the time. I was doing affiliate marketing. And he allowed me to work out of his office. He was very nice enough to this day. His name is John Cristani. I want to give him a shout out. I'm very appreciative of him giving me the opportunity to work out of his office. And Dan was working at the office next to next to us. This was in California. This is in California okay. when I first moved here. I met John through like affiliate marketing circles, and Dan Dan was working next door, and I would I would always say what's up to him. And one day Dan split off from his partner. It was like a divorce, and I was like, you know, I, I was like a guy. I was like, I gotta go move it on this guy, you know, because he's a great dude, and I want to be partners. With you guys him. got along, yeah. Yeah, we got along really well, and he, you know, he had great energy, and uh, you know, I wanted to. 
I really wanted to work with him. I saw that we just fit. We, whatever our mentalities, our, our energies just fit. Mm -hmm. So what were you doing at the time? Were you doing paid uh, ad stuff or? Yeah, at the time I was doing a couple of things. I was marketing uh, online nutraceuticals on top of Facebook. And I was also uh, getting into starting to help companies like e-commerce brands um, d deliver results on Facebook. So I was actually doing two things. I was trying to you know, figure out Facebook, how do I spend $500,000 million a month profitably on Facebook, on Nutra, while at the same time, you know, companies were starting to come to me to say, Steve, can you help manage my advertising spend? I've heard of you from the affiliate circle. So I was doing mainly Facebook advertising. Mm -hmm. So I really want to know what worked for the nutraceutical space, but why do you need someone else at this point? It sounds like well, people are coming to you, you can handle it. Yeah, so the reason why people come to come to like a, a team like us is because Facebook changes and evolves at the most rapid pace that any other online marketing platform changes. You need someone that's in the weeds 24-7, right. understanding every single change that Facebook makes because when they make a change to their algorithm, it can negatively or positively affect how your ads are being, the performance of your ads. Yeah, yeah. So what works for, what worked then and maybe what works now for the nutraceutical space because we're well, talking we're, smaller margins also yeah nutraceuticals are very like very similar to most products in a lot of ways um you know you got to solve a need you got to do two things you got to disrupt the news feed disrupt people from browsing mm -hmm. with it with a, you know either a headline or an image or text you need to disrupt this user from surfing right you got to provide a compelling hook yeah it's getting them to click and then eventually make a purchase. So it's right. disruption, hook, and then trust. It's like you know. <laughs> so what? What's some disruption that you've used in the past that's worked? Oh man, uh, I used to do a lot of scares. So I used to, I used to market these 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 uh these rings inside of candles. And uh, you know, I've heard a lot of those. Of, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a friend of mine's company hired me to market their their rings inside of a candle. So the candle would burn. And like a Cracker Jack box, you know, you get a ring underneath in the candle. <laughs> and some of these rings, they would say, are valued at between $7 and $7,500. So right, you right. might buy a candle and get a ring that's worth Such a great concept, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I hope, you know, I think some people got like really expensive rings. But um, I'll never forget this. I came up with a headline for an ad that got, you know, probably did six figures into the six figures in revenue it was wow. just one little headline it just said new rings just added <laughs> really and all, all it said was just new rings just, and that's it that's it and it was very simple got the word across because people want is they want new they want to be in the moment mm -hmm. and and for that product some people have already bought that product before so they don't want to get the same exact ring mm. and, that ad literally generated probably a you five know, percent plus CTR, um, you know, and we just recycled that <laughs> headline across multiple images, and that's what worked really well on Facebook. Was once you have the hook, it's like almost like you're catching fish. Once you have the hook, you just got to keep rotating that hook across multiple images to disrupt the person's finger. Remember, this is all mobile. Facebook is all mobile now, so you got to disrupt this user. Mm -hmm scrolling down their mobile news feed. Yeah. And I think I was reading somewhere, like people have like three things going on. They have a computer, they have their phone, and they have an iPad, and they have the TV going at once. So you really have to disrupt people's and get their attention. Uh, yeah. Got, it's, it's like it's like a magnetic force. <clears throat> I always call it, you got you to gotta build your own magnetic force to bring people in. You got to be charismatic, you got to be interesting, and you got to have a hook to bring yeah. people in and keep them there. And yeah. I think that's what makes a really good Facebook marketer and a really good, you know, Facebook campaign yeah. is that you understand psychology, behavioral psychology. And mm -hmm. I think one of the reasons why I'm really good at Facebook is because I used to be a stand-up comedian. I used to like <laughs> know people like, in the I, face and judge. Am I is this hitting with them or not hitting it with them kind of thing? It, it, it's, it's Facebook ads is just like stand-up comedy, stand-up comedy in that if your ad sucks, you're gonna hear crickets in the audience. <laughs> right. If your ad sucks on Facebook, you're not gonna get any traffic. Yeah. If your if your jokes suck on stage, you're not going to get any any laughs. But if you provide something interesting and unique, and you say that on stage, you're going to get a whole bunch of people who will be like, "Wow, that's that's yeah, you know, I totally understand. That resonates with me." And same thing with Facebook. If you do so, something totally unique and it resonates, people are going to engage. They're going to click. They're going to comment. They're going to like. They're 
Same exact methodology. You know, in my mind. Disrupt hook trust. You know, with that, were you only targeting them that company's customer, current customers, or was it new customers? Because it probably has new, to do with audience, also, right? This, yeah, this was this was new customers actually. So, mm-hmm. you know, again, you know, people might have heard of similar companies. Mm-hmm. In this instance, people might have heard of similar companies, and they only want to they only want to purchase new stuff. Right. People feel compelled to be in the moment with everything, and I always say, like, if you're doing marketing on Facebook, try to be in the as in the moment as humanly possible. Whether it's a holiday, whether that's a deal, whether it's current events, and I think the reason why that worked was because even for a new audience, because people felt like they were in the moment. Yeah, what what factor um, headline versus picture? Like, what kind of picture do you put to get someone's attention? Because that plays a role too, right? Yeah, so picture is all about, you know, I go back to picture being the disruptor. You know, yeah. you're not going to disrupt anyone with text. I think we could all agree that we've seen stuff on Facebook. We don't remember any of the text. But if you see a picture of something that you're like, wow, what, what is that? That's interesting. Then that grabs you into reading the deal or reading mm-hmm. the offer, you know, if that makes sense. So, I mean, if there's one, not, not Do you this. put text in the picture, like for the new rings just added, is that text in the picture or is that just for a that, headline? That specific example, we yeah. didn't have any text in the image. And I actually think that you shouldn't put text in the image because mm-hmm. I, I think that text actually disrupts a person from stopping. Mm-hmm, now, mm-hmm. now the big thing is video. So video is the new hottest thing on Facebook. And mm-hmm. with video, though, you could do what you call captions where you could actually put text in the video as it's running right. and that works incredibly well because most as you guys know most video on facebook isn't it's doesn't silent have right yeah it's silent so almost 80 percent of people who watch your video aren't going to hear a thing they're all deaf you know right so what works in the in the nutritional space for nutritional for ad, space yeah. is interesting so it's hard to get ads approved on facebook for nutrition because mm. they're very sensitive to before and after, all the stuff that used to work, before and after image. This is how it was before, this is how it was after. You can't um, do anything, that anymore. Can't do that anymore. You can't do anything that's any aggressive, anything that's you know showing a before and after image. Um, you also can't show pictures you know, of people that haven't used your product. You have to actually have claims. So if you claim something, you actually have to submit real claims to Facebook if you mm. want to go that route. If you want to say that, you know, this this product cures all types of skin irritation, everything, you got to submit a claim. But it, what works on Facebook, what always works to this day, is always going to be solving, a, is providing a solution right. to a problem that exists. Yeah. I think that if you think about, like, you know, we work with a company called Preheels. They have come up with a Yeah, talk solution. about Preheels. You got some amazing results with them. I think I've... 30 times sales. With yeah, well, yeah. 30 times sales. They never actually marketed on Facebook before we <laughs> started working with them. So we created a video that provided a solution to a problem. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the reason why Preheels works so great um, is because Preheels is a solution to a problem that no one has really solved. Big problem. Right yeah. You know, I mean, a lot of women wear high heels and, you know, there's a lot of friction and their, t- you know, the backs of their feet are, you know, start hurting and, it's, it's almost like painful to be pretty. As I always joke around, it's like painful to be pretty because of the high I heels. I wouldn't so, know, Steve. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't know either, man. I think we both, we both share that. But, you know, so we provided a solution through a video that shows that showed up on the news feed. We created a video just for the ad, purpose of a Facebook ad. Yeah. And in that ad, we provided a solution to the problem. We said, mm-hmm. here's the problem. Showed an image of, you know, a person putting on their foot, taking it off. And then we provide a solution. We show them how the product works, and this is the expected outcome of the product. Yeah, and it's all in fifteen seconds or less. Fifteen and, seconds. Yep. Oh, is that, that a sweet spot, or is that just for this particular product? Oh, uh, that's usually a sweet spot. It's general general best practice is you want yeah. to have fifteen second or less because people don't they can't focus for any longer. They're, they're you know they're like gnats. They just run around in a circle. They can't focus for a while. <laughs> <laughs> How many do you test? See, so like this one worked. Do you come up with four videos and test them, or do you? How do you navigate that? Usually, we come up with one video and we split test different captions in the video. Mm. If that video is a dud and all the caption testing that we do is not working, then we'll create another video with a different angle. Mm-hmm. I feel like a lot of a lot of people want to always do tons and tons of split testing, and I think that 
that actually complicates the process of A/B testing because hmm. you only need a couple of var- a couple of variables to, to I got test it. it. You'll split test. You'll do the same video with different captions. Yep, different That's captions, interesting. different audiences, different yeah, different captions, different audiences, different conversion objectives. I mean, you can only do you know if you do too much split testing, you know, you're not going to have enough data to be significant to say that this works to this audience. So for this particular, the pre heels, this is a lower price product, right? Yep. Yeah. It's, so it's, how do you make that work on yeah. Facebook? Well, what we do is we we know that if they use the product once, mm-hmm. that they're most likely gonna order it again if it works. We know that their LTV is gonna be high. So initially, when we set out to do the campaign, we had a goal that was realistic. You know, if we broke even on the first sale, that's pretty good. If we could sell that at scale. But what we started seeing was that we were actually able to get a CPA that actually, you know, had profitability. You know, <laughs> really, we were actually just on the first purchase. Profit- yeah, on the first purchase. Like, That's amazing. Day, How is that possible? Because they give a discount too on it, right? Yeah, they also give a discount. And but how we, are you able to do this- that? Are you like a magician? What? what? <laughs> no, I, I mean it's more the product. I always say like I, I mean I always say that but great products kind of sell themselves in a way. It's the product and the creative, but. The you know we launched it and we started optimizing. We started doing some you know a little bit of cross selling to different audiences, and we start seeing that that there's a huge demand for this product, mm-hmm. and that if we, if we could you know as we scale, obviously CPA went up, but we saw that we were profitable on a number of different audiences off the first purchase. Really, wow, that's amazing. So like, what we did was obviously we saw that people a lot of people don't make the first purchase purchase of one click. So we started running, doing a combination of, you know, conversion objective, video views, top of funnel. Then we started remarketing different discount and different hooks yeah. to all the people that watched the video from the first initially. So it's yeah. so go, about using go a Facebook little granular with me for a second on this. So do you, yeah. um, they click right. So is a pixel placed like on their site when they click through, or where does that ad take them when they click? Cause I'm looking at it cause you were featured on Facebook business as a success story for pre heels. Yeah. That's obviously why I'm looking what I'm looking at. And it says never get a blister again. Pre heels goes on in seconds and protects your feet all day. Right. And then yeah. there's a one kicks, one quick spray prevents blisters. When they click, where does that take them? The shop now. Uh, it brings them right. To, so we didn't actually build, or did we, I'm not 100 percent sure. I think we built a pre-sale page okay. that actually showed all the information on the product, like a long form pre, what we call a pre-sale page. It goes off Facebook uh, though to a pre to one of their of to their pre-sale. Like, I'm just looking at a shop. Yeah, now. we built out a, a pre-sale page. Yeah. Yeah, and then uh, then from the pre-sale page, then it brings them right to the to the e-commerce store. Um, so our goal initially was we want to season what we call season this user before they make a purchase. So we want to give them all the necessary information in preparing them to make a purchase. So mm-hmm. initially, what we did was we we saw the video as the, a major driver of success. We saw that people engage, people trust, and people purchase off videos because they're used to it. They're used to watching infomercials and you know and, and making a purchase. So yeah. we thought that like. All the people who watch the video, if we can get a lot of people to watch a video on Facebook, and then we can remarket them with another hook after they've watched the video, that that conversion rate would be a lot higher than just running a click campaign directing people to a website. Right. So that and, they you know, click, that worked really well. They go to the pre-sale page, and then you just want them then clicking through the shopping cart from the pre-sale page. Yep. Exactly. Yep, from pre-sale page to shopping cart. And the people who don't click through, they are retargeted. Then they're yeah, then they're remarketed with another uh, <laughs> with another hook. I mean, there's there's we look at Facebook like a CRM system. Instead of looking at it like an ad platform, we look at it like like an email marketing system. Right. Each user is getting a unique ad experience based upon their prior user behavior. Right. So, what does the remarketing look like? From that person, can't, I can't go into the secrets. <laughs> the- I have to press <laughs> you on it. I mean, you- yeah, man. Um, you know, it's a combination of uh, scarcity and, and uh, you know, scarcity and deal. Right now, it's obviously a lot of deal because it's the holiday season, and right. people want you know, people want both a great product and feel like they got a deal. But you know that's that's kind of the evolution of what we're doing is yeah. we're trying to get away from deals overall. Like I, I tell everyone we work with that. I hate discounting products. Yeah. Like, you're an e-commerce brand. 
before you discount products, there's so many different things you should test out and try yeah. before that. And, you know, we're doing bundles. Like, bundles are huge. Like, we're going to be split testing bundles. Mm-hmm. We're going to be split testing other other add-ons that we could do to keep the product, to keep the price stagnant. Yeah. But I hate, I mean, just as a marketer, I hate discounting. Right. I mean, discounting it trains it to, them to expect it. Yeah. I tell, uh, I tell people here, like my saying in, in uh, marketing is like, I'm like, discounting is the devil. Never discount. Like, there's a lot you could do before you discount because people people know psychologically when you're trying to like, when you're super hard trying to sell people, you know? Yeah, and yeah. I'd rather bring value to people yeah. than discount them. Yeah. You talk about this on one of your blogs and I think there's an episode you guys, you and your CMO talk about this yeah. and you talk about adding value and also just figuring out what the maybe the lowest price product that you have and adding that into a purchase of another product, right? Yep, exactly. So again, like the goal here is you want to get you want to get your products in as many hands as possible. Like you, you know, overall big picture goal. Yeah. And you could do that through add-ons. You could do that through bringing more and more value to people. And yeah. I think a lot of marketers they they really just want to sell, sell, sell as quickly as possible. And yeah. instead of bringing value to people, they're selling the same product that people don't see value in. That's because they're not buying the product. So right. essentially, I want to get, I want to bring people more value in that initial yeah. purchase yeah. and get more product in their hands, knowing that they're most likely going to buy more from me if I bring them more value. Yeah. So Steve, talk about that. I love the add-on concept. What yeah. add-ons have worked for people? Like what have you seen people use as an add-on because the add-on has to be of value too, right? Because it's like, oh, I just threw in this toothbrush or someone doesn't even want a toothbrush with whatever it is. It doesn't matter. What add-ons have worked for some of the customers that they mm-hmm. uh, they used? Try, try, trying to think of like what we did recently with yeah. add-ons. Yeah. Um, ooh. Or um, maybe – With yeah. pre-heels, I think we, we did a – I think we did an extra bottle, like a smaller bottle that I think we might have put out there. Mm-hmm. Not a – not a hundred percent sure in the weeds on a, on a lot of this right, stuff. Right, right. Um, oh, let me think of of an of, a, of an example of an add on. Um, yeah, it could be an add on or just something someone added into it to just boost the value of it. I don't know. Yeah, so we were marketing um, a women's razor club. I can't really say the name of it, but mm-hmm. uh, we were selling the razors, and as the add on, instead of discounting the price of the razors, we added in some some um, some lotion. Some skin lotion for for the razors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was about actually about a month ago, and you know I was very much. And this is a debate in our marketing meeting. Uh, I, I like very, to hear debates. Yeah, talk about. Yeah, it. you yeah. know one of one of our team members. You know we have a lot of strong personalities in this uh, in this company. You know as far as like people very passionate about marketing about like it should be this way, it should be that way, and yeah. I was very much a proponent of keep the price at where it is, and then. Give them more value, and in this case, what we did was they were getting three razors a month. There were, there were, you know, there were pink razors that we're sending them, yeah. and I told them we should, we should add in, um, you know, skin lotion to it. We should add in more. And people you know, disagree with that. Well, they wanted well campaign managers. They they're always worried about their CPA, their cost per action. So my campaign team is like, well, why don't we just give it away for free? Because it was the debate between a free first month versus more value. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And instead of, you know, free first month, we, at this point at Juncture, we said we should add more value to it. And we did get sales from that test. We saw that there was a bump from where it was currently mm-hmm. to what we, to once we added value, we did see a sale. It wasn't dramatic, but in that instance, but we did see a bump in sales. And I say that, like, in the grand scheme of testing, always test out more value before you test out deal and discount. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If you can. So they wanted you to offer a free month, and yeah. you wanted to offer more value. And it's the the keep month the price the you same. keep the price the same. You're not discounting. You're not giving a free anything. Yep. And so, and did you test it against the free month? I didn't test it. I don't want to give away stuff for free because oh. once you give away stuff for free, people expect something for free. So I right. didn't split test that because people on Facebook are smart. I think we could all agree that this like users on Facebook, they're not dumb people. They're intellectuals. Yeah. They're browsing news feed. They're deal hunters. And I want to give them if I give them free, if I give some people free and I give yeah. some people more value. Well, the people on people are going to comment like, "Well, I just got this for free. Don't pay." 
<laughs> right, right, right. You gotta be understand. People are really smart. Like they're not, you know, they're not idiots. They they're gonna like try and find the best deal. Yeah. You did talk about too one way to get them into your buying funnel. Um, again, on your blog or podcast was take that value or whatever the product is and possibly give it away, but charge shipping. Yeah, yeah. So, so this what, is another, what worked for as far as that goes? What kind so of product? I don't suggest this as a brand building mechanism. Okay. I said I suggest this as a mechanism to prove market fit for a product. Okay. Um, initially, when you launch a product, you want to prove market fit. You want to understand how people are engaging with your mm -hmm. product, how people, you know, yeah. are they retaining, are they staying on your subscription, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. So what you can do is you have a, a specific amount of products that you, you know, in your warehouse or that you're shipping out, <clears throat> you could give away that product for free, you know, and then charge a little bit higher shipping cost. Mm -hmm. And then you could kind of break even on the medium instead of just saying, here's a free product, I hope for the best. I mean... Right. A lot of companies now are, are doing that instead of just yeah. giving away the free Yeah, product. I'm curious what, what products you've seen that work for. Because I interviewed <laughs> a guy, he's got a, you know, kind of a beard brand, beard oil company. And he said that worked really well for them. They give out um, whatever it was, like an oil for someone's beard. And they would charge shipping. And they said it worked really well. And the people came back and bought more. Are there any other products you've seen that Consumer, so I see uh, consumer electronics. It works for like very right. low, low cost products that you know that you could really that have a very low cost to them, but a high margin. So anything low cost, high margin. Yeah. Um, any type of yeah, anything that you could kind of break even on your ad spend with that includes the cost of the product. Mm -hmm. So you know, um, there's a lot of widgets that you know. It's mainly it's mainly as a mechanism to get into e-commerce. I'd say to to pit, to test out viability of a product. So, pre heels was an amazing case example, Steve. Yeah. And then me undies. Talk about what you did with me undies. I have written six times ad spend, and you you did a lot with the cart abandonment. I feel like that's yeah. found money for them, right? Yeah. So, so what'd you do with them? I got to give credit to. Uh, I mean, first off, me undies. They have an amazing marketing team. So I wouldn't. I don't think we should take all the credit there. A lot of the people on their team are yeah. super A players. And I'll put the disclaimer there because <laughs> no, the, the real thing I want to is make sure that what I'm finding like for you is is the product is huge. Whatever the product is, yeah. like you can't just sell crap on Facebook. I mean, it's got to be really high quality. It's got to solve a need, you know. And that's what the pre heels people and same with MeUndies. So yeah, we'll we'll put the disclaimer in there. Well, yes, the the product yeah, and the yeah. team is good. So as far as card abandonment, you know, people. People abandon carts for a number of reasons. I'm sure you'd agree. You know. Yeah. So, so why? Uh, well, Tell well, me the psychology. Why? It's in well, their it's, cart. It still baffles me because what is it like? What's the percentage? I've heard different things like 95% of carts get abandoned. That seems strange. They've 60, placed it. 50 to 60%. It's as high as that. It's, it's, it's crazy why people don't buy. Yeah. I, I don't... I don't particularly get it. <laughs> it's in their cart, and then they just leave. Yeah, it's yeah. like you're almost at the finish line of a race, and you're like, "Yep, yeah, I'm gonna finish the race," and then they just stop at the finish line. Like, I don't want to finish the race. I'm I'm done running. And I'm like, "Well, just keep running, go." Right. But um, yeah, they don't. You know, so what we saw early on was that yeah, there there were a lot of abandoned carts, and as we as we actually drummed up more traffic on the prospecting side of the campaign, we saw that there were more. Even more abandoned cards as we as more people are coming in. So we needed to get really creative on our abandoned card ad. So we right. came up with a really cool, you know, a really cool image creative along with a video ad that engaged all the people who just abandoned their card. Mm -hmm. And it was, a, you know, it was a deal. I think I believe, and I, I can't really go deep into it. Whatever, but, uh, I won't press you on it. But whatever you can talk <laughs> but, about. Yeah, it was a, it was a unique it was a unique value prop yeah. that engaged users to come back and complete their purchase. And we just just split testing the unique value props, you know, for all the abandoned carts. Mm -hmm. Just just doing that when you're a big brand, you know, like a MeUndies or you know, like another brand that has a lot of people abandoning their cart. Just doing specific tests around that one area, you're going to see a huge impact on results. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm only I'm only asking because it is posted on Facebook, so <laughs> some of which you can share. I'm assuming because I'm I'm reading it right here, and there's a. Uh, you know, up, I think it's a Facebook business me, you know, success me undies, but they do show like a, a cool image of like people underwater in these, are those underpants or are these swimsuits? No, they're underpants. They're underpants. They're underpants. Okay. I mean, 
You should order a pair, man. I should. I'm gonna send you a pair. They are the best underwear in really? the world. Really? I wear them every day. What is so good about them? Just the feeling, man. I mean, all right. Without going too deep, it's into the softest, feeling. most flattering <laughs> pair that you'll ever wear. Is that what the the headline is? It, it's so true. It's just it's so true about how you know the the fabric is different, um, especially if you like working out and running. You know, like the fabric just kind of like it just feels good on your body when you, hmm. you do workouts and activities and you know i used to be a big hanes buyer and now i don't buy hanes anymore just because you know me me just has a superior product so how does you know see how does uh strategy differ from e-commerce on facebook to regular ads like if someone wants to just get a lead magnet to a webinar or something i hear a lot of people you know they do lead magnets to a webinar how does the strategy differ from that compared to e-commerce it's two it's two different conversion goals I'd say, whereas e commerce is more long term about setting ROAS goals or return on the ad spend goals at different mm-hmm. areas of the funnel. Okay. Um, whereas, you know, lead gen is more about, you know, because you're an you were an expert at lead gen. Yeah. I mean you were doing yeah. you know, mortgage loan right, mortgage e- mortgage insurance, debt consolidation. Right. I mean that's that's kind of the industry that I came from. Right. Um, you so know, what do you do different e commerce? Search and yeah, that's that's what I know like deeply well and I think the difference is is that you want to be able to season a user as much as possible before they talk to a call center with that you know like for most of lead gen the call or the sale is being made via the phone so the question is is how can I season this person with information and you know and make them prepare to make a decision when Mm. someone calls them up and whereas with e-commerce you know, not only I'm evaluating my campaigns in a ROAS, I, I want to show them a cool image of the product to disrupt the news feed. And usually, e-com- usually e-commerce isn't very solution-oriented. It's just, this is an amazing product. You know, here's an image. Catch your eye. Boom. Click. Right. Whereas, you know, le- most lead gen, I'd right. say, it's about selling, uh, you know, selling a solution to a problem that someone has. Right. I mean, that's kind of how I would describe yeah. it. Yeah, because like I'm not on Facebook. I'm like, oh, I need more comfortable underpants or something, and then oh, I see yeah. Mandy's. But uh, but the pre heels does solve a problem. You know that 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 pro that product does solve an issue that people probably have. That, that's that's one. I mean, that's one instance where you know there's an e-commerce product that sells yeah. a specific problem that a lot of people have, but they're not actively searching for it because they don't know that there's a really good solution out there. Whereas, mm-hmm. you know, you look at in comparison, like a mortgage. You know, people want to find the best yeah. rate on a mortgage. They want to feel comfortable. And that's a, a mortgage is a, is a solution. It's like I need a service provider to help me through this time of my life. You know, with the pre heels example, Steve, you know, obviously that I'm amazed that that like a lower ticket item got a positive return on the first sale. What do you tell people? I mean, you probably tell people up front, don't expect this, right? So what should they expect? For a low-ticket e-commerce product, as far as a positive return, at what point should they look at getting a positive return compared to? I mean, the first purchase seems like the golden yeah. gem out there. There's not every. You, everyone is not going to be a pre heels. Everyone's not. Yeah, gonna yeah, be a, for sure. So, what's what's know, normal? Like when you educate someone, like here's what you should expect for so this low-ticket about- e-commerce. It's, I, I really like. I'm one of those guys that just loves breaking down the process to people who've yeah. never marketed on Facebook yeah. before. I, I want, I want to create an educated yeah. person at the end of the at the other end of the line. So what yeah. I like to say is, let's set KPIs or key performance indicators and or goals okay. around specific you know audiences. Like I know like that your remark. We know like right away remarketing will probably work. We know that we could probably spend you know ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars a month profitably pretty confident we could do that on Facebook. Now the question is, is is with most brands, everyone wants to spend a lot of money and also get a return. Right. <laughs> right. I don't just want to spend a lot of money. No, I want no, to get a no return. No spend money and not get a return. So everyone's like, yeah, well, that's great that you got me profitable at 20K a month. And well, how can you get me profitable at 100K a month? How can you get me profitable at 200K a month? So the key that I always like to say is, is like, I, I'm a big believer in managing expectations, so I'm like, right. you know, most likely, yeah, you'll see some wins if you have a decent product and you already have an audience to your website. You'll see some wins pretty quickly. But again, the the, the true goal is how do we scale your product? You know, and how do we generate new customers at scale? 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for that, that customer or that person you're kind of educating, that's not normal to get their first purchase as a positive ROI. You know, yeah. so do you only, do you tell oh, them, yeah. don't expect this, but when we remarket it, that's when you should expect, or do they have to be remarketed, then shopping cart abandoned and that, like, what point is it normal for someone to get a positive return? Well, there's no, sadly, there's no recipe for success. Yeah. I think that, like, you hire... You have it at Mute 6, come on. <laughs> <laughs> you hire a team like us to figure out what that recipe is, you know, you know, and I think like at the end of the day, every single product, whether you're doing lead gen or, or e-commerce or yeah. mobile apps, every single product has its own kind of path to success. And you know, we're gonna figure out, you know, how many impressions or how many touch points that user is gonna you know is gonna need before they make a conversion. We're gonna figure out, you know, which audience segmentation, you know, is gonna drive the highest engage rate, which audience is gonna generate the highest ROI. You know, post engagement rate. Which audience is going to drive the biggest ROAS? I mean, there's so many elements that go into this yeah. that, like, we want to not only like you know figure figure out all these, you know, figure out all these paths to success. Yeah. But we also want to you know, whoever we work with, we want them to be in the weeds, and we want to educate them in terms yeah. of what we're doing and how we're doing. Yeah, I'll ask you an easier question, Steve. This one's easier. Biggest mistake because you probably go in and people are trying Facebook ads or they're never maybe the, you know maybe they have maybe they haven't but what's the biggest mistakes you see people making on Facebook for e-commerce specifically? Um, the biggest mistake like I see you go in, you're like, why are you even doing this? You're burning do, do money. You want, do you want very granular? Or do you want high level? Uh, start with granular. I want to hear. What All right. You, so yeah. the biggest mistake. Yeah. A lot of companies are not excluding audience network in their ads. Okay. So Facebook will optimize your placement around the placement that's getting the highest click through rate or the highest possible rate to to a conversion. And they charge you a specific amount of money to find the customer that's most likely to do the action you want. Yeah. Well, they def when you create an ad and ads manager powered or they default to serving your ad on an audience network. <laughs> and I always suggest You're like there's a lot of I know industry terminology, but basically they're going to serve your ad to people who are clicking the most because they're finding yeah. it relevant, right? Exactly. Yeah. You know, in, in a way, that's, that's that's the case. And a lot of people don't turn off audience network. Audience network is Facebook. Which may so not be a fit like to yeah. buy the product, but they are clicking. Well, is the that inventory right? is not good. The inventory is not as good as Facebook. Mm -hmm. You know, The audience network is the, the Facebook ad network. So audience network is Facebook ads that live on other third-party websites. Yeah. So if people are You're confused, you can look it up. But keep going. Yeah. Yeah, so like you have to turn off audience network. Okay. Just turn it off, and in most cases, when you turn it off, you'll see your conversion rate will go up because so you're getting a lot better inventory on Facebook, and mm -hmm. you're not getting that inventory unless you turn off audience network. Yeah. So turn off audience network. What else? What are other big mistakes are people making? Uh, the other big mistakes is they're they're not segmenting their audiences. They're serving the same free ad or for discount ad mm -hmm. to people that are already customers. Mm. <laughs> Of their of their brand, bad. Like, <laughs> bad. No, yeah. Exclude. <clears throat> you need to exclude all your customers on your prospecting campaigns. Whenever you're looking or hunting for new customers, exclude your current customers, or you will piss them off. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's a huge mistake I see. Like, don't give away stuff for free to someone who's already spent. Right. I already off. bought this, and then now you're giving it away to discount <clears throat> other people. Yeah. That, that's not gonna like. Get anyone to be your friend, you know. It's <laughs> so segmenting is a big problem. People aren't segmenting. No, yeah, a lot of people are segmenting. Um, you know, add to cart. You know, you're sending a lot of people to your add to cart, and you're not actually building an audience around add to cart. You should be building an audience around add to cart. You know, and then drumming, you know, driving specific ads to people who've been banned. Mm -hmm. Any other big mistakes you see people making out there? Uh, let's see. Something. I would say email. I would say email. What do you mean? I would say people are not using Facebook to gather emails. I wouldn't say it's a mistake, but I would say that Facebook is a great source to drum up, you know, your own audience data. And mm -hmm. I think that people aren't leveraging lead ads to the power that it is. Lead ads is a very powerful system that we've had a ton of success with. And I think like so you know, ads where people click and then they subscribe type of thing. Yeah, like so, a, like so, lead ads allows you to you know create a lead um, create a lead capture window inside of your ads mm -hmm. without leaving Facebook. It's yeah. only it's only on mobile, so I would say that you know you should do that. Um, totally do lead ads. 
Another thing that I suggest is creating different ads for Instagram. I see a lot of people using the same exact Facebook ads also on Instagram. Really? Instagram's a different user. So I'd say creating a different user experience for Instagram. Yeah. Um, another thing is a uh, huge mistake is people don't reply to comments. They don't yeah. reply to comments? Yeah, negative. Yeah, you, you have to reply to all the comments on your ads. Oh, I see. So people neglect the people who are actually commenting and engaged. Yeah, they don't say a word. Yep. So whoever's managing your page, I say definitely. <laughs> Get in there. Yeah, you've already paid for them. Yeah, you might as well. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Headspace, Those are the main things. I mean, Headspace yeah. worked well when you did Headspace, right? With lead, yeah, it was that about, Yeah, we, we worked with them when they first started out. It's about three years ago. Yeah, and they're big. They're, yeah, they were very very brand conscious they, they create amazing content and they really like were really interested in their customer they yeah. really you know did a lot to nurture this customer through their headspace process yeah um, do, do you meditate no but i've heard of headspace <laughs> yeah for i, I use <clears throat> do you meditate app, like, yeah i use the app every morning and, really <clears throat> yeah I, i'm a big believer that like to market something you, you got to be a user of the product you got to yeah. just you're into something, you gotta use it. You gotta be, you, know, you just gotta go all the way in. And I, yeah, I totally using... picture you with like the women's razors just testing. Oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Just all my pink, you know, pink razors all over my back. Right? <laughs> the, but, uh, so the headspace, the new subscriber, is that what worked well for them, the lead ads? Yeah, that so, we, yeah we did a lot of exclusions. So we exclude all their current customers from okay. all of our ads and we, we had different ads that brought people in, you know, six, you know, six session trial, and you know, you know, we and then we'd have a different another set of ads that would go from free trialist to uh, you know paid user. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That really that was like early on with Facebook. They two three years ago, like Facebook did not look and feel like it is today from an ad perspective. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the tools that we would use today, you know, like dynamic product ads and some carousel ads, like a lot of that didn't exist. Didn't wasn't <laughs> even available. Yeah. What are some software tools people should consider using um, with Facebook, whether it's retargeting or tracking for e-commerce? What are some ones that you recommend? Ooh, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, people always like software and tools lists, so look them up. So what should, yeah, where should so we send them? You wanted, so I, I know a lot of people use smartly.io. That's for like very large budgets. Okay. We don't use that in house, but I, I think they have a really good tool set. Okay. They built on top of Facebook. That's smartly.io. Okay. Um, what else? Uh, Looker, L O K E R. Mm -hmm. um, they do LTV and attribution. So they're a really good tool if you really want to understand the LTV on mm, your that's on huge. your head. Yeah. Yeah. Looker is a really really cool tool. Like let's say you capture an email address off an ad, and that email then purchases. And you want to assign a dollar value from that purchase all the way back up to the ad. Yeah, yeah. So Looker's a really good tool for that that we've we've worked with in the past. Um, mobile. I mean, if you have a mobile app or mobile app attribution, we've used. Uh, I think we've used Cochava in the past, and we've also used um, Has Offers. Those are tool tools that are really good for attribution, where you want to attribute an install or a conversion all the way back up. The funnel, yeah. Back to the Facebook ad, yeah. And uh, what else do we use? Uh, those are those are the three that. Anything three personally that you like to use, just for like productivity or just to, to manage the business, because you have you know twenty over twenty staff that you have to manage, and your personal life and the business. What do you like to use? Just software, just tools software, or, so or I mean, apps I use, or something. Uh, yeah, I use Apple Notes. Apple Notes controls my day. Really? Okay. <laughs> I know that's. That sounds crazy, but um, yeah. Apple Notes. I use Headspace. Headspace, Headspace is my uh, my meditation app. Mm -hmm. um, I use Runkeeper to track all my runs. I like mm -hmm. I like going out running. Mm -hmm. um, what else do I use? I use um, I use I use Body. Uh, what is this thing called? Hold on a second. Bodybuilding.com. I use their app for workout for different types of workouts. Mm -hmm. um, uh, let's see. I'm just looking at some of my biggest apps for productivity. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Steve, I could, I could talk to job. you uh, all day. I know you have a, a couple meetings you have to get to. Yeah. So what should we leave people with for Mute 6? 
I mean, obviously, we've talked a lot about the different successful campaigns and some of the mistakes. What else that should people know about Mute 6 and what you do over there? Yeah, so, you know, I'm a big believer in empowering people to become better entrepreneurs. Like, I, I'm on a mission to share, like, all my learnings and information that I've taken from, you know, running so many campaigns. So I encourage, like, anyone to, like, reach out to me directly if you have any questions about how to leverage Facebook as a platform. I also have a deep experience in email marketing and drip marketing as well as, hmm. obviously, Google AdWords and ad and anything Google-related as far as ads. Yeah. Um, so I think that like without working with us, you know, directly, if you just have any questions, you just wanted some insight on a specific topic, I always say just reach out to us because yeah. you know there's gonna be something that I might need to learn from you. I think we all have a unique skill set and something unique we bring to the table. Yeah, yeah, that's very generous of you, Steve. Um, yeah. So people should check out mute6.com, right? M u t e s i x dot com. Anywhere else we should send people online. Uh, we have a we have a podcast called ten ten thousand dollar ten k a day podcast. Yeah. that's on our website. That's so good. it's uh it's short but sweet. Yeah, it's <laughs> so we do about two podcasts a week on everything Facebook ads, e commerce, customer acquisition related. So yeah. anything new that comes out, we talk about it on our podcast. We dive into it. Um, you know, we have our blog, which gets you know we produce two or three new content pieces a week. And I also just have a, a personal blog that I, I blog on some more like personal issues, and that's stephenjweiss.com. Yeah. And if you, you know, want to get to know me as, on, a, on a personal level, that's pretty much my personal blog. And music. It gets personal. It gets real personal. Actually. Yeah, man. I mean, you know, I, I think that the more you share, the more you trust people. And I think the more you trust people, people will trust you. Why mute six? I, you know, I never set out to start an agency. Yeah. And. I always thought I did not want to be called like something media or something internet marketing this. And I was like, I want to be something unique that people like, you know, kind of ask, what does that mean? <laughs> and like, I found out there's a, there's a solar system. So, you know, I looked up the space. I'm like, there's got to be a name of some solar system that, you know, oodles and oodles away. And there was a, there's a solar system I found called Mute. That's just the name was Mute. I know it doesn't sound like an agency name because you want to be loud and I'm not, you know, but. In, in the solar system, there were six planets. Hmm. So I put the two together. It was Got called it. Mute 6. All right. Love it. <laughs> Steve, thank you. I'm going to be the first one to thank you so much for your time, knowledge. Yeah. Everyone should check out Mute6.com. Fantastic, Steve. Appreciate it. Yep. Thanks, man. Yeah, we'll talk soon, Jim. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire. Came out better on the other like a beach if you find the sand and right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand